So let's talk about Brett Weinstein, who uh, he has been uh, criticizing my crowds before. He's been shocked by Nazi Twitter. And, he's, uh, and when I was uh, giving arguments that were presenting a case that he has committed plagiarism, his, his answer to this was, well, uh, I've seen people who follow him on Twitter they are Nazis, therefore, be careful. This is what he said. Be careful about people who associate with such thugs. So, so there was a whole jump back then in his response from, okay, this guy is accusing me of plagiarism based on his observation of my statements, to, well, his followers are that way. To, I have seen a couple of anim anonymous accounts among his followers that seemed like they could have been actual Nazis. Uh, and to, well, they are therefore committing violence. They are thugs. And therefore, careful about this guy. What? Careful because he has audience members that could be violent? And uh, now we are in front of a new situation with Brett Weinstein, he has realized that there were also people in his crowd <laughs> that are thugs. And so where does that place my plagiarism accusation against you, uh, Brett? Because now I'm a thug-associated person, you're a thug-associated person. Uh, I will say careful with the plagiarists, the plagiarists out there who are uh, associating themselves with violent thugs. Because now this time, uh, he doesn't have the excuse that another scientist is associated with these neo-Nazis of Twitter. Uh, now he's, he found them into his own community. And he, he cannot believe, uh, how can they be so rational on the COVID and vaccine question and yet be so irrational on this question? And the fact is that they are not irrational. They are what he calls Nazi Twitter first aren't necessarily Nazis. There's a bunch of reasons why someone would publish a swastika, why someone would make some reflection on World War II that may be outside of what you would normally think or outside of the usual discourse that wouldn't make them Nazis. It makes them Nazis in your mind because Brett has this this very Jewish construction, this dehumanization of the white man claiming his uh, place in the world. And he's going to package this all in Nazis because that's the code word for someone like Brett to dismiss anything that can come from it, anything including good science. Because this is the current state of the world. This is, we are faced with someone who, in his own field of expertise, refuses to consult a work because the work could have been read by Nazis. That is the extent to which the irrationality of Brett has brought him. It has brought him to the point of denying himself the epistemological, hedonistic pleasure of discovery and understanding of the world to replace that with an ethnic hate toward a bunch of people that he mischaracterizes and misunderstands anyway. So let's see what he has to say. And I'll try to explain it to Brett. Uh, Brett, you, it, it's not these people who are losing it, who are disconnected from you on other questions than COVID. It is your rationality that defects into this domain. Your you are so hateful of alternative views of history of other people that you cannot conceive rationally of this particular subject. And you should, because you know all of the ingredients to public extortion on certain and bad incentive systems on certain questions. When it comes to COVID, you understand them all. You understand that all these people, these experts who show up to defend the vaccine, they are working under a set of bad incentives. Big corporations, pharmaceuticals paying them, uh, advantages on the side of grants, 
if they do the right thing in the eyes of Fauci. This and that. A bunch of bad incentives. I'm stunned that you cannot transfer this, this perfect understanding that you have of bad incentives in the case of COVID, that you cannot transfer them to the problem of uh, World War II history and, and the, whole, the whole thing that you call Nazi Twitter. <clears throat> we are stuck with the problem that in most of Western civilization, it has been declared, and the U.S. being the only exception, but, but it's, it's becoming less and less of an exception on this, it has been declared that a, a bunch of views around certain historical subjects are criminal. We have criminalized historical research, thought, and just freedom of consciousness. That is the current state in Europe. It's the current state in Canada. And it's increasingly the current state in the U.S. as there are more and more these uh, anti-BDS laws that are basically trying to say, well, if you have this historical view, you are being unfair to the Jews. If you are unfair to the Jews, you can't have public contracts. If you are associated with a corporation, you must sign something, uh, a corporation that gets public contracts from the federal or state government. You must sign a little paper that says, I, I acknowledge the, I will not boycott Israel. I acknowledge the validity of Israel, blah, blah, blah. Basically, a, a testament of, uh, of kneeling to the Jews. Uh, that is the current state of America in a country that has a First Amendment. It's much worse in Canada, much worse in Europe. It's to the point where someone like me, I do not have a strong position on World War II. I, I, I don't have a dog in this fight very much. But someone like me looks at systems and incentives, and I must, I must look at the truth here, and the truth that I know for sure is this. The debates around World War II history and specific points, and I can't even go into the details, the debate hasn't been had fairly. There, there is certain positions that you can attain into these uh, subjects that have been criminalized, where people are intimidated, and beyond the criminal intimidation and the intimidation of actually being put in jail, which would be enough in and of itself, there is a whole class of definancialization tactics, of uh, reputational ruining, of hit pieces, of personal attacks, of family attacks that are deployed against people who have a certain perspective on history. And that, to me, as a truth seeker, who doesn't care about even the answer to the question, I don't give a shit. But it makes me, it makes me say, Whatever it is that I'm being told by the TV, by the books, by the academics, by Brett's undergrad paper about it, all of this is existing into a biased, unfair system where certain thoughts have been banned in advance. So they never had a chance. They never had a chance to the debate. They never were tested properly, and I can never be fully exposed to the best argument for them as long as we criminalize this kind of attitudes and beliefs. That is my position. Let's see what Brett has to say in this segment, which led me to these considerations. I had gotten, for whatever reason on Twitter, dumped into what I call Nazi Twitter, mm -hmm. right? And I tweeted about it yesterday or the day before, and I got back a reaction that I was not expecting. That is a reaction of that kind because the current generation has decided that they weren't transmitting the taboos of your generation. Simple as. That's why, that's why you have a whole bunch of Gen Z edgy accounts. That's why you have someone like me who doesn't give a shit and... Uh, who, who's willing to to take the whole the whole price you have to pay just to be opened intellectually 
just to be, hey, you know what? I'm not gonna shit on the head of David Duke. I'll invite him on my show and we'll talk barbecue and we'll talk uh, gym. And, <laughs> and he's going to show me, hey, Jeff, you should, you should live like this. You should do this and that with your nutrition. We don't care because we have decided that it was ending here. Uh, the current generation is the last generation that will cultivate any guilt by skin color associations with ancestors that have nothing to do with th that that should not be held in the head of current people in terms of guilt. And, and just to give you an example, I come from a line of de descent uh, that is fully white fully Catholic, fully French, to the point of 23 and me giving me 100 percent at this point. They, they had started giving me some English genes at the beginning, but eventually they did more research, and now in my account I can log in. And now I'm 100 percent French, and I know because I know my ancestry tree very much uh, down to France. These people have never been participating to slavery. These people have never been participating to the Holocaust. These people were just good farmers. And yet, uh, we are being told that I need to be scolded and I need to be, to be told a, a version of history that has been designed so that I would endorse evils that have been committed by some by people who are totally different from my line of descent but that i should take a part of it onto my shoulders because i'm white that is the current state of holocaust education that is what they are pushing to introduce more and more into our elementary schools and the the current generation uh, the, the young people of today have have said I don't want any of this. I will not feel any guilt. When I say Nazi Twitter, I am talking about a part of Twitter where swastikas are not viewed as negative, where Hitler is quoted. So swastikas not being viewed as negative. You, you have to understand that you are paying the price of the ultimate of having worked so hard to be the ultimate taboo of society you you have won the first position in many ways the jews uh the jews have just bringing this subject in a conversation is the most awkward subject you can possibly do uh at least in the old generations you know uh you have made the subject of yourself criminal in certain jurisdictions, extremely socially punished in others. And as such, you have also become the butt of the joke. It's fucking funny to take the thing that people hold most dear in their cognitive structure of taboos and to revert it, to play with it. That is the goal of humor. Out of the anonymous accounts that you browse, perhaps some of them are being comedic. Perhaps some of them are being exaggerating. Perhaps some of them are playing with the swastika as an emotional tool of triggering people, of, of, of pushing away certain people and attracting others. Uh, there are many legitimate users of symbols like this who are shocking in nature and will lead you to a brain that can reconsider certain assumptions that we've been asked to adhere to. And so it's not because you see a couple of swastikas on Twitter that I will be offended anymore. I think there is legitimate edgy posting out there that's being done that I love to browse, that is sometimes funny, edgy, sometimes dark humor is at play, sometimes simply just because because it's such a symbol that is triggering just triggering of emotions and interesting to consider i want to read all of this i don't want to be 
limited in what I can read. Uh, now he goes on and explains the view of these people on Hitler. In an effort to illustrate that he is not who we were told he was. In fact, the idea that is commonly circulated in the... Well, uh, someone is always someone else than the, pe the, the person you can represent in a history book, right? You could write a history book about me. It could be 5,000 page long. It could be 20,000 page long. You would never have captured the real JF. And so certainly, when, when, you, when you construct uh, the enemy of, of, of Western civilization slash NATO as it has come to be it, the, the original enemy from within has been Hitler in the post-World War II kind of Western cognition. When you construct an enemy of that kind and you, you describe him in historical book based on his strategies, his political advancement, you're, you're going to end up having created a caricature no matter what. And as many people point out, and th that's why it's interesting to point out, hey, Hitler was drinking water too, you know? Why is it? Why do people say these things? You know, oh, Hitler was a vegan. I, I don't know that he was a vegan, but we hear those things a lot. That's to make people realize that no one, no one is ever the caricature of evil that you would want them to be when you establish a ultimate myth for a society. The real person must have had things that motivated them that were good. There must have been a perception of themselves that they found was a righteous path to take. The very path that you think was evil, they must have perceived it in a way as good. And that's a point I've made about Jeff Epstein. Uh, and they quoted me on Wikipedia for this. It, it's still in my, it's still uh, smearing my name on Wikipedia. But but I stand by the statement. I said people can't just be evil, because there was a journalist who was asking me, Jeff, uh, you know, why did you why did you uh, ask money to Jeffrey Epstein? And I said, we if someone has done evil, we have to give them the opportunity of doing good. Someone can't be just evil. <laughs> and so I have extended this uh, super empathy to a Jew. A Jew in Jeff Epstein, uh, when I, I gave him an opportunity to make amends and fix some of the damage he had been doing in society. And, and I say, you, we, should expect, we, we should extend this empathy to everyone. I want to read quotes of Hitler on Twitter that, that give me another uh, historical perspective on him. I'm not saying he didn't do evil things, but I, I, like to, I like to understand history better. And we won't understand history as long as we have this caricatural view of, oh, this is the absolute evil, like any sort of inspection of the inner psychology of the man is barred, taboo, you just don't do that. That is not how you understand the world. That is not how I want to understand the world. And I'm a man of the not so young generation. Now I'm getting old, but I'm very much connected to the current rise of a generation that does not give a shit about putting taboos where I would prefer understanding Hitler than having the perfect caricature of him in my head. So I welcome these quotes. I love them. Certainly, he must have thought in some way that what he was doing was good. I'd like to know more about it. In this part of Twitter is that the television is lying to you, which I'm sure it is. Mm -hmm. Now, that is, that is the most beautiful part. He acknowledges that the television is lying to you. <laughs> I'm sure they're lying, but 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 it's another thing to say it that that clearly about 
uh, this particular historical subject. No, 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 no. If they're lying, we must say they are lying. So I, I want I want people out there to be specialized in. I want some artist who's just obsessed about this question and find me the lies. Be critical. Find me everything that's wrong about it and debunk it for me because I'll never get to the point of being so interested in the question as to, and I couldn't anyways. This particular subject, I couldn't research it. Uh, it's just, it's not legal. Uh, but I love to see that there's a country in the world, America, where people can do it. And there's been prominent speakers that I would like to see Brett debate. I would like to see a debate between Brett and Nick Fuentes. Let's, let's go. Tell me your arguments, Brett, and let Nick express his arguments. I would love to see it. But that the television is lying to you, that Hitler actually was not interested in war. He was interested in peace. And well, do you deny this? It's an interesting take that, that internally Hitler wouldn't have triggered such a large war and that he merely reacted to the expectation that anyways they're going to attack me, so let's attack instead. Um, it's absolutely possible. What is the evidence that he thought that way? I'd like to see the evidence. And that the narrative that has been created around him in the aftermath of the Holocaust and World War II is a construction of you. It's always a construction. Uh, a book will never capture, a, a historian will never capture a full character. Impossible, Inform informationally impossible, too much compression. You guessed it, Jews in Hollywood. Mm. Well, our, our view of World War II is very much influenced and determined by Jews in Hollywood. I have the 50 top here, 50 top Holocaust movies on IMDb, Schwindler's List. Director Steven Sp Spielberg, Jewish. Uh, what else? What are the big ones? Uh, the Pianist. The Pianist. Uh, director Roman Polanski. A Polish Jewish musician struggles to survive the destruction of the Warsaw Ghetto of World War II. So, yes, and on top of Jews and Hollywood, there is Jews and the Academia. There is a lot of Jewish academic researchers who are interested in uh, documenting the Holocaust and documenting World War II. So definitely it is correct for this Nazi Twitter to point out that Jews have taken the battle of the minds to a place that is extremely aggressive in the domain of creating public consciousness on matters of world war two right now amazing amazing but then here's see see i just i just pointed out to the fact that everything stated up to now is real it's true it's true and, and some of it brett uh agrees with it like the tv the, the case of the the tv being liars he says maybe they're they're lying yes so he agrees with some of it. I've just shown that all that Brett has stated there is real and true. And yet they are like amazing. Ama am you're amazed at what? You're amazed at the truth, Brett. You have not debunked a single statement you've made. Here's the crazy part. <laughs> so, okay, so this was amazing. <laughs> and it was true. Now let's get to the crazy part. That's not, that's not every account, okay? Most of the accounts over in that land are replying there, and there are some people over there that I know, people who have actually defended us in some cases. Uh-oh, so now there we go. We have the admission that there are tugs, there are tugs in the fans of Brett. Well, 
I believe that based on past interactions with Brett, that gives me the right of completely dismissing what Brett has to say. I will simply in the future point out to the fact that Brett associates with criminal thugs and that we should be wary about anything that comes from him. These people are not Nazis, mm -hmm. but they are now trafficking in a kind of sophistication or false sophistication that I know what it is. Because false sophistication. Someone was pointing out that this is the specialty of this show. Because frankly, I wrote a paper. Not this show, JFG Tonight, but the Dark Horse podcast. False sophistication is all that's being done there. On it in college saying, here is what this impulse to genocide actually is. To watch people now trafficking in Hitlerian revisionism, including, you know, seriously, we're talking. And see, see, this is so critical. Brett believes that it is one of the great qualities of RFK Jr. to be able to review, to revise his view based when presented with new evidence. In fact, he's going to say it even in that very show. So revising your view in the face of new evidence is righteous in the view of Brett. But revising your view of World War II in the face of new evidence, in the face of quotes that you may not have heard about different characters of the time and what they thought, now that is not righteous. What's the difference here? You are revising your view. You're revising something that most people believed or that you ended up believing because it's been taught to you that way. You're presented with new evidence. You change a little bit your mind. The fact that Brett can be so hostile to revisionism when it's that subject and so welcoming of revisionism when it pleases him is what's wrong. It is the, the irrationality I'm talking about. It is what I call Brett's suspended rationalism. Talking about... Accounts who have been, you know, in one case, an important COVID dissident account, it's an anonymous account, so I don't know who, who it is, but um, we're talking about people who should know better. <laughs> oh my God, a, a total absence of argument. And he often gets to that point. He often gets to, when he doesn't know how to properly debunk a view that he criticizes, he often says these words, he should know better. Uh, you know, he should know better. Uh, he says this of an anonymous account. It just turns out that this anonymous account has followed their rational process in a direction that doesn't please Brett. DK Shadow says they should know better. How dare they? And we have a, in the reply of Heather Eying or Heather Heyer, I always mistake the two. Uh, we have a, a similar experience. She experiences the same thing. But for her, it's not Nazi Twitter. Of course, because she talks so much about the trans issue. For her, it is this transphobe Twitter. What I'm hearing from you talking about this and what I'm seeing over in... Um relations between the sexes is okay full stop we're done all of that was a mistake let's go back to trad everything racist misogynist everything homophobic all of it right and it can be easy if you're not paying any attention the problem here is that Racism has been a label applied to a series of personal preferences and sexism and homophobia. They've all been modern labeled, applied to pre-existing preferences that had evolved and that, were, that are not properly described by these labels. Uh, homophobia is, is a perfect example. Uh, phobia is to be afraid of something. 
is it possible for someone to prefer that their children not be gay without being homophobic? Is it possible to have a preference without having a phobia? Is it possible to say, I like vanilla ice cream, but I'm not chocolate ice cream phobic? But this kind of leftist language of the modern days, racism, sexism, homophobia, this kind of language makes it a dichotomy, a false dichotomy, that one cannot prefer without it being a form of aggression toward the other side that they don't prefer. And ultimately, it is a trick of language developed by the left to instaurate a form of entitlement that, that wasn't just. Because you should not be entitled to converting the children of other people into gay, into homosexuals. You should not be entitled to be ch part of a chosen race that everyone wants to date. Perhaps people don't want to date in your race, and that's their right. So all of this labeling is really not uh, helping. It is actually misframing issues that are legitimate preferences of the past that had pro probably evolved, that were probably uh, organizing society better. These preferences that, oh, I prefer dealing with people like me, from the same religion as me, from the same race as me, and I prefer dating people like that too. And this has all been converted to homophobia, sexism, racism. That is the problem. The, the fact that you endorse these labels to begin with means that you are trying to get into this debate with a already established preference. Attention at all to think that those of us who are critiquing the uh, the overreach, the uh, bludgeoning of people with actually new racist things. And See, in the mind of the boomer, the only way the left can be criticized legitimately is to criticize their derives, their derivation into other forms of racism. That's interesting. So it means that the left must be given a space of action. They must be capable of advancing in so many ways, except when they go too overtly anti-white racist. It's interesting, but it's dangerous to think that way. Uh, it's dangerous because it sets the anti-racism of the left as being the only legitimate issue. And the only times the left must be criticized is when they overspike into the reverse racism, into the anti-white racism too aggressively. But otherwise, the left doesn't have anything to question. This is a boomer myth, and it's why, you, it's why a lot of boomer conservatives even will come to you and say Democrats are the real racist. It's because they cannot conceive of a good political argument other than we must fight racism. And newly sexist ideas um, <clears throat> are are part of the problem, but it is a new it, it, this this call to tradition, this call to what has already been is so often what you're seeing and what you're calling Nazi Twitter and what I'm seeing and I don't have a name for it yet, but certainly what is being revealed in a lot of the trans ideology is this like okay part of the problem. You know what I see? Oh, the problem is that women got the vote. Really? That's where we are? We're allowed to say that now? Uh, yeah, we're allowed to say that since the foundation of America. <laughs> yeah, we're allowed to say that. Uh, sorry. Uh, it's the First Amendment. It's, it's not even new. Oh, okay. So guess what, pseudo-lefties? this is your making like th this 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 is something that you have helped create you have helped come you know bring out into into the public with strength 
because you are saying things that are so insane that people are looking around going like, what, what can I do? Maybe the only thing I can do is to seek to reverse the clock by 150 years and see if we can't start over from there. Well, uh, the reason to go back to tradition is to note that nature converges toward points of stability, that the current state of society hasn't been attained or hasn't been stable for thousands of years. It's a very novel thing, this whole thing where a, a state teacher can decide that your child is... That, that your son is your daughter now, that, that is absolutely novel historically. And so the return to tradition makes sense in that tradition, just by its property of having converged there and remained stable for thousands of years, indicates some sort of quality that is sustainable. Whereas current society shows no signs of being sustainable. So that is why people are headed toward tradition. Now she comments on, she's basically scolding the left here. And the issues that she takes with the left is to have uh, thrown the frog in boiling water rather than turn up the heat progressively. That part is a strategic comment on the left. I will not comment further on it. But in general, uh, as a conclusion on this uh, subject, Brett is being particularly irrational when it comes to this whole triggering around Nazi Twitter. I would encourage him to... And in fact, it's what I've been planning for years. Even before I wrote my book, uh, I've been planning that there would be people like Brett who would be would have this irrationality and I wanted to kick it out of them. Uh, I, I didn't know that it would be Brett then, but I knew that there would be people who would not engage with the truth, who would not engage with a precious advance in science, and they would, by doing so, they would demonstrate that their political preferences are more important to them than the state of the truth and even the state of truth in their field of expertise. Uh, it, it's stunning how Brett eventually rose on the scene and became that very person I knew would one day exist. Uh, that person who would have to pass the ultimate test, Papa JF's final exam. Whether you're capable of putting your political preferences aside and get interested in something purely for the truth of it. So Brett, here's your final assignment. Read the revolutionary phenotype and clear your mind of all these. There's a reason people are reacting to your tweets negatively and in a way that you, don't sus you didn't suspect. It's because it's, it's showing. It's showing how you let the mor moral world take away the quality breath who's interested in facts who's interested in science, we miss that guy. Bring it back.